Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and also good evening, depending on which time zone you're in. So my name is Eunice and I'll be chairing today's webinar. Welcome to our Applying for the Overseas Training Program webinar series. Today we're covering the training pathway for Hong Kong. This webinar is brought to you by Cardiff Healthcare International Perspectives, CHIPS in short. So CHIPS is a community of healthcare students based in Cardiff University, who is keen to educate and also support our future healthcare leaders. We organize regular teaching sessions, clinical OSCE revision sessions, and also quiz sessions. Today, we have two very wonderful speakers here with us today, um, Dr. Oscar Chu and Dr. Johnson Tam, who will be covering a range of topics. Both our speakers obtained their medical degree in the UK, and they're currently working in Hong Kong. Dr. Chu will mainly be covering the pathway to practicing in Hong Kong, whereas Dr. Tam will be speaking on how to be a competitive ING, and he will also be focusing on the HKMLE exam. Just a few housekeeping rules before we start this webinar. Firstly, the webinar will be recorded. Second, at any point, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them down at the chat box below. We'll try to answer all the questions you have if time allows. And if there are any similar questions, we'll just skip through them. And lastly, please remain muted at all times and do not share your video. All right, so we'll move on to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Oscar Chu. Dr. Oscar Chu is a higher physician trainee in cardiology based at Ratanji Hospital, Hong Kong. He is also the founding and council member of the Medical Licensure Society of Hong Kong. After obtaining his medical degree from University of Southampton in 2013, he spent four years in the West Extinary, completing the foundation program and the core medical training program. He founded the Overseas Hong Kong Medical Students and Doctors Society platform in 2010. So over to you, Oscar. Well, thank you, uh, Eunice, for the very kind introduction. And again, thank you um, to the CHIPS for inviting myself and Johnson to be part of this um, um, International Medical Graduate Webinar Series. Um, I understand you guys have had previous webinars based on other countries' pathways like um, uh, Australia and um, Malaysia, etc. So I'm hoping that, you know, Johnson and I can shed some light as to the, the ways that you can practice in Hong Kong. Um, as some of you may know, the, the pathway to return to Hong Kong is slightly different to the ones that you might expect in Australia or in the US or Canada. So majority of our talks will be brief um, and hopefully concise and we'll leave most of our time to the Q&A session if that's okay. Um, so what I will do is um, start off by talking about the various pathways um, on how you can return to Hong Kong. I'll just share my screen here. Just double check that my screen is shared, yes? Yes. Good, okay, so um, just a little bit about myself. So I graduated from Southampton, like Yuna said, in 2013. Um, I then finished my foundation program and the core medical training program in the West Extinary. And then I got my MRCP in 2016. As part of the pathway to return to Hong Kong to practice, I passed the Hong Kong medical licensing exam. And as part of the um, licensing requirement, I finished one year of internship in Hong Kong and I resumed my physician training um, back in 2018. And I'm now currently a higher trainee equivalent to sort of a registrar in, in cardiology based at Rutenji Hospital. Um, and outside of medicine, I, uh, I also, I'm, I work with medical students at my mother's school where I arrange clinical attachment program for them. And um, like Una said, we founded this medical licentiate society back in 2019 last year, and I'm one of the founding and council members. Um, a little bit of bias, I am, you know, there are two pathways to return to Hong Kong, but I am more biased towards the licentiate route. Um, I have been involved with a couple of the talks in the past, so apologies if my talk is probably a little bit more heavy on the uh, like licensing exam side. But apart from that, I helped 
I've helped with the hospital authority, which is the public hospital um, authority in Hong Kong, equivalent to the NHS, um, with their limited registration recruitment scheme in the past as well. And so just a little bit about um, the two routes that I've mentioned about returning to Hong Kong to practice. Firstly, obviously, you have to complete your UK degree. Um, and followed by that, you have to have at least one year of clinical experience. And in the UK, that will be your foundation year one. And following of that, you can then either take the Hong Kong Medical Licentiate Exam, or you can then join the limited registration scheme. And there's a slight difference between the two. Um, and I'll talk about both of them as well. Now, a bit about the licensing exam. Um, it's actually existed for quite a few decades already, but it became more prominent and more important after 1997, um, after the handover where Hong Kong no longer recognizes degrees from the Commonwealth countries. Um, the exam is coordinated by the Medical Council of Hong Kong. It's held twice a year. Uh, first sitting is in March and the second sitting is in September. It basically consists of three parts. Um, and once you've passed the three parts, um, you then have to do an internship assessment, essentially your houseman year, which will be uh, at least six months uh, to 12 months. I won't go into too much detail about the licensing exam because Dr. Johnson Tan will be covering that in the second part of it. Uh, but essentially there's part one, which is professional knowledge, part two, which is a proficiency test in medical English, and a part three, which is a clinical exam. And I'm sure Jonathan will talk a bit more in detail about that later on. But essentially for you to apply for the exam, you have to have completed not less than five years of full-time medical training approved by the council. And essentially anyone who's graduated from the UK, from a UK medical school will be eligible. Um, but at the time when you sit the exam, you have to have completed a full-time internship resident in the hospital. And um, you have to have good standing with the uh, GMC essentially. Um, one of the main things that people talk about a lot is the HKMLE pass rate. Um, it, it's allegedly you know, known to be very tough to pass in the past, um, but actually in the last, sort of between 2014 to sort of 2017 or 18, the pass rates have been a bit higher. Um, it does vary from year to year and it's dependent on multiple factors. Um, it does depend on the proportion of the mainland medical school graduates. Um, there's often been a question about whether, you know, the pass rate has to do with the local supply and demand of, of healthcare worker needs, whether, you know, they might not need as many doctors, therefore the pass rates may be a bit lower, but, you know, so far there's no real direct link um, between that and the pass rate. Um, and, you know, often people hear about pass rates of the exam being in the single digits, sort of seven or eight percent. Um, that percent is more likely to reflect a one tick pass. Um, in other words, you, you pass part one, part two, part three within the same setting. And actually, from personal experience and from experiences from previous candidates, it has certainly been difficult to sort of do a one tick pass. It will be sort of in the 10% region if you want to pass the exam in one go. Not to say it's impossible, and I'm sure Johnson and I will share later on how you can go about increasing your chances of passing that exam. Now, apologies, there's a bit of Chinese on this website. Apologies for those who don't read Chinese, but essentially these are some of the past, um, past rate percentages since 1977 to sort of 2011. As you can see, um, this column is part one exam. This is part two exam, and this is part three. And you can see the percentages there. Roughly, you know, you don't really see the numbers to be passing sort of 30%. Sometimes you can even see single digits down here for the part one written exam. Whereas for the clinical exam in this part, um, because I think part one, part two more or less acts like a filter, um, once you get to part three, the, the pass rates are a bit higher. So I think once you get to that stage, people are definitely trying to pass the exam so they work harder and also the good candidates have sort of sift through part one and part two, so the pass rate tends to be high in part three. Um, I will skip through these slides. Essentially, it's about the percentage of 
people who graduated from various countries who take the exam and their corresponding pass rates. What this slide in summary essentially shows is that for those who graduated from the UK, US, Canada, Australia, um, tends to have a higher pass rate compared to say people who have come graduated from the mainland Chinese medical school or any other um, country's medical schools. Um, so that is something to bear in mind that if you graduating, if you're graduating from the UK medical school, you are already at an advantage um, to passing this exam. So here is the latest passing rate of the latest um, sitting. So in September 2019, uh, the reason is, you know, we're supposed to have a March sitting in 2020. We're supposed to have a September sitting this year as well. But obviously both sittings have been cancelled due to COVID-19. They don't want you know, overseas students coming into Hong Kong and, and there's a lot of border control. So they've canceled the exam this year. But this, these are the percentages in the latest sitting last year in September. So 15% pass rate for the written exam in part one, 88% pass rate for the English test and 46% um, for the um, clinical exam. So, so it's not too bad once you get to the clinical part, you more or less have a 50-50 chance of passing it. Um, so this is a summary of what's your HK, what, what the HK MLE route, MLE route is. You pass the written exam, you pass the HK MLE exam, which has three parts. You then get what we call provisional registration, where you then fulfill a six to 12 months internship requirement. Once you've passed your internship, you then obtain your full registration. The key thing to full registration is that you are not limited to where you work. You can either continue to train or work in the public sector, or you can choose to leave for the private sector, which we all know is another big um, sector we have in Hong Kong. So that's essentially the route you take if you want to take the HKM route. Now, what happens when you do the limited registration route and what is the limited registration route? As the name suggests, you know, it's not full registration. So there are some limitations to it. Um, and particularly with hospital authority, which is the main employer of the public sector hospitals, they've started doing the limited re recruitment scheme since the 2011, 2012 year. And they do it under a certain ordinance in, via our medical council where they grant them limited registration to people who are selected for particular types of employment. Um, so, you know, unlike someone with full registrations, these limited registration practitioner, practitioners are limited to where they can work, for example, to specific conditions or restrictions. At the moment in Hong Kong, on, there are currently three um, main settings that you can practice under limited registration. One is the Department of Health, where you work under the government. Two is under the hospital authority. And three, by the universities, either the Hong Kong University or the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So a couple of requirements. Obviously, I mentioned about, you know, good thing is you don't have to take the exam for this this you know, route. However, um, there are some requirements for it. And at the moment, the hospital authority is hiring um, people who are at service resident level, which is sort of um, SHO registrar level to associate consultants, which is a specialist level. Um, and as you can see on this table, you do need a qualification that's comparable to the Hong Kong, some of the uh, examinations of the constituent colleges of the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine. However, because of certain demand needs in Hong Kong, for example, for certain specialties like emergency medicine, family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics, if you have a pre-intermediate level qualifications, then they would also consider your application. So for example, in medicine, that would be if you've done a MRCP part one, they would also consider you as well. Um, you also have to have possessed you know, certain relevant clinical experience as well. So you, for example, if you're medicine, you would have had to work some time in say a core medical training program. And, and you know, quite a specific requirement here is that you have to be proficient in English and Cantonese, which is the local dialect, except for specialty, specialties where you don't have that much patient contact. So that'll be uh, anesthetics, pathology and radiology. And as you can see that, Requirements for associate consultants for these specialties are similar, but you have to be 
completely registered as a specialist in your equivalent and relevant specialty in your origin country. So for example, in, in the UK, for you to apply for an associate consultant, you have to have finished your registrar training before you can apply to be an associate consultant under the limited registration scheme. Um, so there have been some latest changes. Obviously, previously with the limited registration, you have to renew your contract and you have to renew your registration with the Medical Council every year. And until 2018, you, you, you have to do that on an annual basis. But because the government has tried to promote the limited registration to make it more accessible and popular, they've then extended it to three years. So at the moment, you know, you can apply for a job. If you've been approved, you get a contract, then you have that limited registration with you for three years and you renew it again at the end of three years, provided that your employer continues to employ you under that contract. There's also been some latest changes. This came at about middle of last year. Um, previously, if someone was to pass the life, remember that limited registration, you still can't work in the private sector and you're still not fully registered. So you, you're essentially stuck in, in a prerequisite such a sort of uh, setting where you were. For example, if Hong Kong University have, have hired you as a doctor working for them, then you can only work for them. You can't do private work, you can't go elsewhere. Um, but to get full registration, for those who are under limited registration, you will still have to go through the limited, you still have to go through the licensing exam route. Um, back then, you would still, uh, even if you're consulting, you would still have to do six to 12 months of internship, which to some may be a bit tough. So what they've done recently is if you are a specialist and you've passed the exam and you've worked for the public hospitals or, or the universities for three years or above, then you're exempt from the internship, provided that you pass a licensing exam. So some of the change, they've made some changes recently to make the limited registration scheme a bit more accessible and then a bit more popular as well. So what's the recruitment process for limited registration? And I take this slide from the hospital authority head office, uh, giving credit to Dr. Sharon Wong. Um, there's an online application um, and I have a link at the end of the presentation. You apply online, you submit your documents and once they've reviewed your documents, you, can, you will then be interviewed by a selection board. And once they've verified everything and you've done your pre-employment checks, et cetera, if you need a visa, they will apply for you. Then they will then issue an offer and you start work. So this process, you know, have been streamlined to the point where you know, it's a lot less complicated than it was before. So what is it like in the limited registration route? So the, this diagram is similar to my licensing exam route but this is for the limited registration route, okay? So at this point, at the very beginning, you would still have to have completed your medical school exam. Uh, you would still have to have done some clinical work in the UK. Now, you can then work under the limited registration scheme once you've applied and you've proved, you then work in Hong Kong. If you decide you don't want to go private, you're quite happy where you are working in a university, then you continue to renew your contract and registration on a three yearly basis. Another option is you work on the limited registration scheme and while you're working, um, you pass the HKMA, HKMA exam, but also you have to have worked at least for three years under that limited registration scheme. Once you've done that, you can then apply to get your full registration. And once you've got full registration, you can then decide whether you want to go public or private. You have that freedom. So one of the things that people ask about is, you know, majority of people who are interested in this talk are probably people who are got family in Hong Kong or previously born or raised in Hong Kong, they're thinking about coming back. But there are also maybe other people who are coming to Hong Kong for adventure, et cetera. But, you know, pay is obviously an important thing. And this is, a, this is probably one of the biggest difference between the Hong Kong job and the UK job is, is, is the you know, massive difference in, in the pay. Um, if I remember correctly, I was a CT2 before I came back to Hong Kong and, and my earnings at that point was about 2,600 pounds per month. And as you can see at that level in Hong Kong, you're looking at around 7,000 pounds a month at least. So, so in terms of pay, you're looking at least double to even triple. Um, so that's something you know 
to consider when you come back. Obviously, it's not going to be the main point, but it's something to consider. And the good thing is um, slightly different to the NHS, the, in the hospital authority, um, every single year you work, every single year of experience you gain, you get an annual pay point increments. So even if the government doesn't, or the hospital authority doesn't give you a pay rise, you're still going to jump pay points every year. So every year your, your salary will go up and up and up. And for a nine year contract, which is quite typical for, for anyone working in a hospital authority initially, you, every three years you complete, you get a 15% contract and gratuity, um, which equates so to about 30,000 pounds. So they, at the end of three years, they'll give you a lump sum of about 30,000 pounds. And then at the end of six years, they'll give you about and a lump sum of 60,000 pounds, et cetera. So, you know, this keeps going up and up until you get to nine years. So in summary, I know I had to end on a, on a pay point because money is important, we know that. Um, in summary, so what's the difference between the two routes in Hong Kong? So you, first you obtain your medical degree, you complete your one year of internship in the UK. Um, you then can choose to pass the, take the HKMLE route straight away you need to fulfill your six to 12 months internship criteria uh, requirement and then you obtain a full registration and then you can work in hong kong you can either continue to train in whatever specialty you want or you can go private in terms of the limited registration scheme provided that you fulfill the specific requirements that i mentioned in my slides early on you can then work under the limited registration scheme either continuously or take the exam while you're working in limited registration scheme and then pass the exam and then get your full registration. So I hope that was a brief overview, good enough brief overview of the two various, the, so the two uh, most important routes that you can do to get back to Hong Kong. And some of the additional information I leave with you, you've got the Medical Council website, you've also got an information portal. If you want to find out more about taking the licensing exam, and this was the website I told you about in terms of the hospital authority hiring for non-locally trained doctors. And this is specifically under the limited registration scheme. So if you want to click on that, you can, or if you want to Google search it, just Google search um, hospital authority, non-locally trained doctors. Usually the first link pops up will be this link. Um, and last but not least, I will leave you with this page where you can find out more information about our society on on general information of taking the exam, networking, how we prepare you for the licensing exam. We run written and clinical exam workshops. Uh, we also have social network and study groups via WhatsApp groups as well. So that's been very helpful. We currently have more than 200 uh, paid members and we also have around 400 plus people within our WhatsApp group network. So feel free to access these two links uh, via the QR codes and make sure you like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram for the latest news. And again, thank you, Chips, for inviting me. And um, I'm, you know, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you for the very detailed presentation, Oscar. So we do have a few questions for you. So firstly, is proficiency in Cantonese necessary for all registration schemes? i.e. the licensing exam route? Um, so actually, with regards to the licensing exam route, it is not necessarily, you do not need to have proficiency in Cantonese for the, limit, for the exam route. I've known many of my colleagues who don't speak any Cantonese. They, they manage, it's a, it can be difficult, but they still, the main struggle would be the internship part because majority of the patients in Hong Kong speak Cantonese and the majority of the staff are very proficient in Cantonese. They can still speak English, but it would be a bit more difficult to work without Cantonese. However, I do know a lot of my friends and colleagues who've been through the exam process without knowing a single word of Cantonese and they can still get the full registration. So it's a bit tougher, but it's definitely doable. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Is it harder for people who are not born or do not have a citizenship in Hong Kong to get a job in Hong Kong? very much you know job in terms of job opportunities as a doctor is not really a big issue in hong kong if you look at the exam sort of licensing exam route once you've passed the exam and once you've 
got your full registration, you then have the freedom to choose whatever job you want, whether it will be in the private sector or whether it's in the public sector. Um, the public sector is always looking for people to join the workforce, um, whereas the limited registration, provided that you've passed the interview and you fulfill the requirements and they think they're suitable, uh, you're suitable for their department, then you'll get a visa and you'll get the job. It's not a problem at all. Okay, next. Are all universities in the UK, Australia and US recognized by the Medical Council of Hong Kong? So as far as I know, uh, all universities in the UK and Australia are recognized. The US is also recognized. Obviously, we understand there isn't a list. Um, but from our previous experience of all our previous candidates and our members, um, we haven't really had anyone who's been rejected to take the exam, as far as we know. So as far as we know, provided that you have a registration in a in UK, Australia, US, then you can definitely, you know, do the exam and be registered once you've passed the exam. Okay. Um, next question. Is proficiency in terms of speaking and reading and writing or just speaking for Cantonese? I'm assuming that for the limited registration scheme, because for the written, uh, for the licensing exam, you, they don't really test you for that. But um, in terms of proficiency, they expect you to at least be able to speak. Um, you don't necessarily need to read, to be fair. I've got friends who can speak but can't read and still work in the, in the hospital authority. So it's mainly the, the speaking um, that is more important. Obviously, if you can write and read, then that's perfect. But speaking would be the, the least, the minimum sort of requirement. Next question. Do I need to take the internship right after passing the licensing exam? Or can there be a time gap between passing the exam and the internship? Oh, okay. I'm assuming Sharon means the Hong Kong internship. Um, yeah, so you can apply to delay your internship for very specific reasons. And you can delay up to, so I've known people who've delayed it up to five to six years. But that's really based on academic or training reasons. For example, if you are already a registrar, say you're an ST3 in UK starting, say, cardiology, you've just passed your exam. You can then apply to start your internship after your registrar training. So you can say, the reason why I'm postponing my internship is because I want to finish my registrar training first. And I've had people who have applied for that and have that approved. So it's not a problem. You can, you can delay it, provided there's a clinical or academic reason. Mm. Um, final question before we move on to the second talk. If I'm from the UK, when do you think is the best time for me to take the HKMLE? I.e. which year of UK training should I be at? It, there are two trains of thought on when is the best time to take HKML. First train of thought is take it as soon as possible, right after you finish your foundation year, because that's when you still have the majority of your knowledge. And Dr. Johnson Tan will definitely cover a bit of that as well later on, because you know majority of the exam, it, you know, it's a bit like the USMLE where it covers a broad range of topics, obstetrics, gynecology, surgery, orthopedics, psychiatry. So you've got the majority of the broad knowledge once you've graduated from, from university. So, you know, it's probably easier for you to retain that knowledge the earlier you take the exam. I've known people who have taken the exam once they become a consultant. You know, for example, you know, I've got a fellow um, founding and council member of the licensing exam. He's a US ophthalmologist and he's been a consultant for many years and to suddenly then have to go back to learn pediatrics after so many years it can be a bit difficult so you know I think the general advice is take it as early as you can um, would be your best chance of passing the exam. Okay thank you very much Oscar. So we'll move on to our second presentation now by Dr. Johnson Tam. And after Dr. Tam's presentation, we'll have a final 10 minutes Q&A session. Um, so just a brief introduction about Dr. Johnson Tam. He graduated from the University of Bristol in 2017. He's currently an orthopedics houseman in Kuang Wah Hospital, Hong Kong. He completed his foundation years and first year of core surgical training in orthopedics in the UK before moving back to Hong Kong in May 2020. 
He has also completed a postgraduate diploma in medical education, MRCS Part A and HKMLE. Over to you, Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Eunice and Jits, for inviting us and also for the great insight into Pathways in Hong Kong. So um, my, my um, objective today is to let you guys know about the HKMLE. Um, so a little bit about myself. So I was born in Hong Kong. Um, I studied in Hong Kong until I was uh, uh, in I moved to uh, UK boarding school um, and then did my foundation training in Birmingham and completed my first year of course of training as well in uh, West Midlands. Um, I did my HKMD last year uh, um, in the September 2019 sitting and also did my part three in November 2019. So um, all in all, I did, it, it, I did everything within um, the late uh, latter part of 2019. And luckily passed uh, on the first attempt. Um, and now I've just started um, at Kwangwa Hospital um, doing my HK uh, internship right now, um, doing um, orthopedics. So a um, quick overview of HK MBD exam. So there are, as Oscar said, um, two sittings per year, uh, March and September sitting. Um, part one and part two are paper-based, uh, where part one is examination with professional knowledge. Um, there are two papers, each with 120 uh, MCQs, uh, best of five questions, and they are usually spread over two days. Um, and then part two is a proficiency test in medical English, uh, and it's a three-hour paper. And I'll go through in depth uh, what each of these papers consist of. And part three is the clinical OSCEs. And again, I'll touch upon all of this uh, in my latter slides. So part one is, as I said, 120 MCQs, best of five, three and a half hour paper. Um, so interestingly, with the HKMLE, um, you, you do get marks deducted if you get an answer wrong. So um, as I remember, um, I think it's a mark of 0.25 will be detect, uh, deducted for each incorrect answer. Um, and you have to, in order to pass the paper, normally they're looking at around a total mark of 50%, uh, i.e. 120 marks out of, uh, i.e. 120 marks to pass. So paper one, again, there are 120 multiple questions and these are the um, breakdown for them. So basic science, medicine, pediatrics, and psychiatry. And it's surgery, orthopedic surgery, ONG, and some ethics slash community medicine questions. Um, now, how to revise for this? Um, so most of the time, if you're looking to come back to Hong Kong to do this HKMD, you might have some friends who are currently studying um, in Hong Kong University or City um, sorry, CUHK, um, the university, which are the two medical schools in Hong Kong. Um, and they usually have a massive question bank full of questions. And sometimes these questions do appear uh, in the HKML. So um, if you do have friends studying in these medical schools, it might be wise to um, ask them for their question bank and share uh, while you're preparing for the HKML. Now the level of uh, uh, depth of knowledge um, is somewhere in between MBBS, MBH3, uh, MBCH3 finals and membership exams. Um, so when I did it, I would say it's a little bit tougher than my finals at Bristol, but it's not quite yet at MRCP slash MRCS level yet. Um, and to revise for this, you can use UpToDate, which is, uh, as or, or some of you may know, is a really reliable online resource for latest medical um, uh, conditions and diagnosis, treatment, etc. Sometimes people like to use past medicine, past tests to do um, practice for this exam. And I would encourage you to do that as well if you want. Um, but personally, I'll recommend you um, finding question banks from HKU slash UHK students and uh, really just look around and see what, question, what areas you're weak at and practice those areas. Now, part two is, as I said, the, uh, the let me just go back. It's the uh, proficiency test in medical English. And this is um, one paper, 
and it's three hours long and it's usually very straightforward for those who have studied abroad in a English speaking country such as uh, the UK, the US, Australia. Um, and it's, it's a very simple paper. Um, you, know, you have to read a simple comprehension and answer some true and false questions and write some uh, rec um, referral letter to a patient, uh, for a patient attending a clinic. So it's, it's a very straightforward paper and you don't really need to prepare for this. Part, so after you've passed part one and part two, uh, part three is the next one. And the, that's the OSCE style. And as Dr. Oskuch uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, most people who pass the part one and part two do tend to pass the part three as well because they've um, jumped through the part one and two hoops, which are normally the more difficult uh, part of the HKMLE. So for part three, um, for the medical uh, OSCE, you are tested in a long case for 20 minutes and several short cases uh, over 40 minutes. Um, now, um, for the long case, you are allowed 40 minutes uh, with no examiner, with no other doctors, uh, where you are one-on-one -on -one with a patient, you take a history and you do a, a physical examination, um, you know, depending on what, that, uh, what the patient presents with. And then you have to present that case to two doctors um, who are normally social consultants or consultants um, at the hospital. And they will ask you some questions about the condition the patient has, um, what investigations you would suggest, and um, what management you would uh, suggest for this patient. After that, you will then go into some short cases, and this is um, for 40 minutes. So um, if my math is correct, so all of these should add up to 40 minutes. Um, and you would be tested in a patient who's predominantly got an abdominal problem, um, patient who's got cardiovascular problem, patient who's got adrenal medical problem, respiratory neurology, another general medical problem. I'll go into depth a bit more about uh, when I took it and what cases I, I got. Next uh, part of the OSCE is the surgical um, station. So you have eight minutes. So it's a quick, uh, quick, fast, uh, intense uh, surgical part of the OSCEs. Um, and these stations can vary between history taking, examining a patient, or looking at a CT scan, uh, abdo x-ray, etc. Another part of the OSCEs is the pediatric part. Now this part you have a long case where you have 20 minutes to see a patient um, and it's usually a parent or uh, when I did it, it's usually an actress, so the mother of a, of a, a child. But in this um, pediatric station, you will have examiners uh, watching you while you take a um, history. Um, and you, you, you won't need to examine the, the patient because the patient will be an, an actress. So there's nothing. There are several short cases where you will go around a big room when I did it, uh, a big room full of um, pediatric patients who do have real conditions, who do have signs, and you are um, required to pick up signs and offer your differentials to the examiner, who again normally is an uh, AC or consultant in the hospital. Finally, we have ONG of Sangaini, um, and this is. Um, a, uh, a part of the OSCE is where there are nine minute stations. Um, and when I did it, um, there are three interactive and seven non interactive stations. So the non interactive stations are normally just SAQs rather than MCQs. And the interactive um, stations are, when I did it again, uh, history taking, explaining a scan results. And so so now I'll go into depth into each segment of the um, OSCEs. So these are the stations um, I got for my ONG. Um, so, so you can see that there are three interactive stations. So number one, two, and three. So this was some questions about the conditions listed here. I can't remember precisely each question, but these are the topics that do commonly come up. Uh, in the medicine part um, of the OSCEs, I got a patient with Graves' disease. And do the appropriate 
uh, um, examination for this patient. And obviously, to, uh, after investigation and management, etc. Into the stations, these are the cases I got, so um, I won't go into depth into all of them, but essentially, uh, the patients came to the um, this is, uh, uh, renal transplant. Uh, Sorry for the technical problem. We'll try to add Dr. Tam in as soon as possible. Sorry, can you see? Sorry about that. Are we back on? Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can see your screen now. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. No um, and the next we have um, pediatric stations. So these are the questions I've got. Um, but, and these are genuine patients with these signs. So you have to be good at uh, picking up signs in a short space time under pressurized condition um, and for the surgical stations these are the cases that I got um, a couple of CT scans after an orthopedic examination vascular examination lumps and bumps and a patient who had a goiter um, so essentially that is the nuts and bolts of the HGMLE um, now in terms of revision materials as I mentioned um, th there are some question bank from HKU and slash EHQ uh, CUHK students. And also there are tend to be some revision sessions held in Hong Kong around the time of the exam. And um, as Dr. Chu mentioned earlier on, there are um, a number of WhatsApp groups that um, you can join um, which do advertise these revision sessions. Uh, and I do recommend you to attend these sessions because they're very helpful. Um, in teaching you what the local um, medical system look for and how they practice medicine over here in Hong Kong. Um, you can also email uh, for clinical attachments in the various hospitals in Hong Kong, um, just to get a vibe of what the local practice is like and what the patient demographics is like. Um, I think Dr. Chu earlier on showed the um, exam statistics in the in the late 2000s and early 2010s uh, yes so this is the passing rate so as you can see paper one and two the pass rate do uh sorry the paper quite low paper two as i mentioned is the english paper which uh, most people will pass if they have studied in an english-speaking country and to be a bit better um, so last year, uh, 70 is the number maximum they, they have um, for each uh, clinical examination period. So 70 sat it and 30, uh, to 70, 32 passed. So the percentage isn't too bad uh, in the OSCEs um, part of the HKMLE. Um, and that's it. I could go to questions. Okay, thank you, Johnson, for the presentation. Um, so we do have a few questions for you. Given both of yeah. you, oh wait, sorry. Uh, let me get the question. Um, how do you find the work-life balance in Hong Kong compared to the UK? Johnson, um, I'll go first. Because I probably just I'm I'm more fresher to Hong Kong than Oscar is. Um, the work is a bit more intense in Hong Kong in um, in the sense that I have I see that there's people mentioning 36 hours on call and that do still does still happen in Hong Kong. Um, so it's a bit more busier. You have more patients to see. Um, but I think 
once you move back, you will settle in quite quickly um, and you'll get used to the system quite quite sharply um, because otherwise you will tend to fall behind and people, uh, your consultants give you a kick up the backside just to make sure that you do it. But it's, it's manageable, it's okay, I think. Okay, um, next question. Will the patients in the OSCE speak in English or Cantonese? I assume that's for the HKMLE exam. Yeah, um, so they will speak in Cantonese, but you can request for a translator uh, in your application. So if you don't speak Cantonese, you, you'll still be okay because they can offer that service for you. Okay, um, next question. Provided with the current situation in Hong Kong, would you still choose to go back to Hong Kong or staying in the UK? Um, so for me, um, the reason of coming back to Hong Kong was because of my family are all based in Hong Kong. So what, uh, no matter what was happening in Hong Kong, what's ha happening with us, I will still come back to Hong Kong just because because of my family. Okay. Yeah, no, Jonathan, I agree. Um, I think it very much depends on the reason you come back to Hong Kong. Um, if it's for family, then of course you would want to come back home. Um, and obviously there are other reasons as well. Um, obviously there's, like I said, there's there's the work, there's the life in Hong Kong, there's also the pay. So it's, it's multifactorial. Um, but yeah, I, you know, someone did ask about the training difference between the Hong Kong and UK as well. And I think Johnson and I were mentioning something briefly as well. You know, UK training is very much very structured. Um, you know, you have a tick box, you have a checklist exercise every year to tick off. Um, Hong Kong is a little bit more old school style where it were very much still sort of see one, do one, teach one kind of method. Um, but you do have that old systems benefit where you still have that apprenticeship style where you will basically have a mentor or a senior that will be you in the same department that you you know, you earn your trust and you build your relationship with. So you do get more sort of a, what they said before was, you know, what the old consultants used to say is you still have that firm, you know, environment where everyone grows and learns together. So I think that's slightly different in Hong Kong. Okay. So we're at our final 10 minutes of the Q&A session. So the first question for Dr. Oscar Chu, if you have passed your HKMLE and work in Hong Kong to a certain level, can you move back to the UK and re-enter at the same level of training? I'm assuming for, so I'm assuming that's if you've, you're in ST1, you do the exam and then you go back to Hong Kong, is that, was that the question? Um, I'm exactly sure, but probably I think point of training from moving back from Hong Kong to the UK. So the Hong Kong training isn't, so once you've ex, ex, done your exec exam in Hong Kong, you've become a specialist in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, the Hong Kong specialist qualification isn't recognized in the UK. Yeah. So once you become a specialist in Hong Kong, you can't necessarily be a consultant in the UK. Um, and I've had people tell me that already. Um, however, what you can do, and I've had someone do that is they come back to Hong Kong, do the exam, pass their internship, get the full registration, then they go back to Hong Kong. Um, I'm sorry, then they go back to the UK to continue their registrar training and what whatnot. Because um, in Hong Kong, for you to continue your full registration, there is an, an annual appraisal, you just have to pay an annual retention fee. Um, so there isn't so much of an issue in the UK where you have, in, have to have an appraisal every year to retain your registration. Okay, thank you. A question for Johnson. If you have passed HKMLE part one, how long do you have to pass part two and three before having to redo part one again? As I remember, I think it's within a five year span. Um, I think that's the latest figure they give. Or, or five attempts at the next part. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So um, you, all five attempts done, as well. Yeah, if, if you've done part one and you failed part two a couple of times and then, then you lose your part one, um, pass. Okay, question for Oscar. Will you struggle working in Hong Kong if you do not speak Cantonese or Mandarin fluently? It very much depends on the specialty. Um, 
colleagues and friends of mine have worked without knowing a single word of Cantonese in, in specialties like anesthetics and radiology and pathology because there's no patient contact like I mentioned before. But if you are thinking of working in a specialty, especially in a public sector, um, in where you might have a day-to-day -day patient interaction, then not knowing Cantonese will be a massive struggle. And actually, departments will probably um, think twice about hiring. Um, whereas once you've got your full registration, because there's still a good proportion of expat community in Hong Kong and there's a lot of expat clinics in Hong Kong, they will hire people who speak English. And in those clinic set, clinical settings, you are only dealing with patients who will predominantly speak English. So it depends on whether you, de it depends on whether you want to work in public or private. You know, if you're in the public, then unless you're in radiology, pathology, and aesthetics, then Cantonese is basically a must. Okay. Um, question for Johnson. Apart from having your medical degree and possibly done the specialist exam, before applying for the limited registration scheme, is there anything else that would put you in a better position compared to other candidates? Hmm, I, in terms of for things like perhaps in, in my in my experience as a as a surgical trainee, they don't really look at things like research or publications or attending to conferences. That that doesn't that's not such a big deal on on the CV in Hong Kong, whereas I know it's a bigger deal in, in the UK. So, um, yes, it, it's good to have um, your exams done, but it necessary other work experience, it may put you in a better position, um, but not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. For a question for Oscar, is there anywhere we can get past, I'm assuming past your questions for the HKMLE? Uh, um, we don't necessarily have past questions on, um, on the HKMLE, but various study groups have got shared resources where they can recall questions from previous HKMLE, uh, papers. Um, I cannot, um, deny or or you know agree that they, they, they exist but you know there is more information and there's a lot of resources and you can definitely get more resources on the exam via our society the licentiate society okay. next question for johnson um mm -hmm. Is the specialist residency, i.e. for surgery, competitive as compared to the UK? Um, so this changes um, effort uh, in Hong Kong compared to the UK. Um, essentially, if you have done a housemanship in a hospital and the um, consultants or head of department likes you, then they will likely offer you a job if you're interested in that specialty. Um, otherwise, they do have a, um, an, um, a, tra a training recruitment program, normally around January slash February time, but uh, um, it's, not, it's not as transparent as the UK system, I'll say. Um, so it is competitive, um, but if you have done a housemanship uh, in that department and they do like your performance, then you are likely to get in, if the space is available, obviously. Thank you. Next question for Oscar. What training level do you have to reach in UK in order to not start as houseman in Hong Kong? Um, so this applies to both the licensing exam and limited registration. So for limited registration, you basically have to be a consultant in the UK um, to be able to qualify not to do any houseman years in Hong Kong. Now for the licensing exam, it is slightly different. Um, the licensing exam has very specific um, requirements for that. And for someone to, basically you have to have, do, you have to have to have do some houseman if you go through the HKML route. It's just whether you do 12 months or six months. Um, if you're a specialist, and for example, if you're a surgery specialist, um, then they can reduce your 12 months internship into a six months where the six months you mostly just focus on the medical 
Houseman departments. So you don't have to do the surgery or orthopedics anymore. Um, but essentially, unless you go through the limited registration and work at least three years and pass the licensing exam during your limited registration, then one way or another, you have to go through Houseman here. Uh, thank you. First of all, John started working in the UK as an F1, completed licensing exam, so I reached a certain level in Hong Kong. How could I go about returning to work in the UK? Um, so I presume that means having done the license exam and done an internship in Hong Kong or not the internship. So essentially, if you've done the internship in Hong Kong, and then you'll be granted the full registration in Hong Kong. Um, so you can either continue to practice in Hong Kong or if you um, have withhold your training in the UK, you can return to the UK and continue the training there. Um, I do have a friend who is a paediatric SPR in the UK who's returned to the Hong Kong this year and done, in, doing an internship um, with me. Um, and she's planning to do the internship here and return back to the UK to finish her training. So it depends what um, your situation you're in, what life slash family situation you're in um, but you can train back in the UK if you want. Um, question for Oscar, how many times can you retake part one and are, there only, and are they only available twice a year? Uh, second part is yes they're only available twice a year and you have to take them in Hong Kong. They're either in the first sitting is usually in March and the second sitting is usually in September. Um, you have to double check that on the licensing exam information portal. Um, but the maximum number of times that you can take any pass, I believe, is five times. Okay. Question for Johnson. What is the pay for internship year? <laughs> that question always comes up. <laughs> um, so the pay currently for me as a houseman here is around um, $30,000 per month. Um, but as Dr. Chu mentioned earlier on, there is a big jump um, next year when I hopefully get my full registration and you start at around $71,000 per month. So there is a big jump, almost, well, more than double, really, um, from houseman to um, medical offices here. Okay. Just, just to correct that, that is £3,000 per month. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah, which, sorry. Yeah. Which, is in, which is in what... I was earning even as an S, as a CT2. Yeah, so the, the, the jump is quite big. Yeah. Um, next question for Oscar. Can you obtain full Hong Kong registration after internship, return to the UK to finish specialty training, then return to Hong Kong as a consultant? Sorry, can you just mention that again? I can't find the question. Yeah, uh, it's, it has been sent to me privately. Ah, okay. So, can you obtain full Hong Kong registration after internship, then return to the UK to finish specialty training, then return back to Hong Kong again as a consultant? Um, the answer is unlikely. Because you haven't gone through the training pathway, um, unless you get hired under the limited registration scheme, um, because you haven't gone through the process and of, of obtaining your, your qualification in Hong Kong. So your consultant registration, your, your specialist registration in the UK is recognized in Hong Kong, but actually you have to go through a lot of process of getting that approved by the, by the council, by the colleges in Hong Kong. Um, and I don't think I've really had that. I've had friends who've done the, who was a consultant in the UK, did the licensing exam in Hong Kong, gone through the internship exam, and then he can then be then hired on, but not necessarily as a consultant, because remember in Hong Kong, the, the, the department structure is very much different. Um, it's very much a pyramid. So instead of having 10 consultants in the department, you only have one or two. So majority of you still end, will, would end up being what we call an associate consultant rather than a consultant. So, you know, you won't get a equivalent jump. There, you, you would, there will be some gains and loss um, along the way if you jump back and forth. Okay. We, we do have a few more questions. Are the speakers happy to answer them?
Oh, yeah, yeah. A few more questions. Okay, so next question for Johnson. Any websites for further information about the private sector in the UK regarding uh, paid specialist training and also competition ratios? I presume uh, you mean you mean Hong Kong. Um, I think I can't. So I don't know too much about the private sector here, um, but you can. There are there are private hospitals recruiting for medical officers once you get full registration, and of course you can move out to the private sector after you've obtained your training in the hospital authority pathway. Okay, next question for Oscar. Hi, I'm currently a radiology SPR in UK. Can I apply via the limited registration with two to three years of experience in radiology? Uh, Dr. Tan, yes, you can. Um, again, I would encourage you to visit the Hospital Authority website. They have um, they have changed the um, clinical experience part slightly for certain specialties. Um, I think three years is usually the minimum, but I think for some specialties, they will allow one to two, but um, you better check the website because the problem with limited registration, especially from the hospital authority perspective is there's been a lot of change since 2017 and very much every six to six to nine months, they managed to tweak it slightly in one way or another. And I have no doubt that whatever I talk about today will be different again in a few months time. So the best thing to do is check their website to double, just to see what the latest um, requirements and changes are. Okay. Next question for Oscar again. How does specialty training work after passing the HKMLE? Like for Oscar, did you get straight back to CT2 after the internship or did you have to go through specialty application again? Yeah, so there's actually two parts to your question. One is the specialty application and two is whether the UK experience gets transferred over to Hong Kong. With regards to the first part of the question about application, it's actually the Hong Kong system doesn't have the same specialty program application where everyone submits a central application, you're all assessed according to your points, you get interviewed and then you get ranked and then you get to pick whatever jobs depending on how many points you get from your specialty. Hong Kong is still very much uh, sort of, you submit a CV letter, uh, you get interviewed by the department heads and consultants, and if they like you or you've worked in the department as a houseman before, and they like what you've done or do they like your personality, then you get hired. Um, that's how it works. Now with regards to, you know, what the experience is, you know, because I've done two years of CMT in the UK, and it very much depends on the specialty. Certain specialties are very transferable from the UK to Hong Kong. For example, internal medicine is because MRCP is recognized in Hong Kong. So A, I didn't have to redo my MRCP when I got back to Hong Kong. And two, the two years of the CMT that I did, I, it got immediately transferred into experience into Hong Kong. So I didn't start as a first year sort of train, medicine training in Hong Kong. I started at a, as a third year. So that's one of the advantages. Whereas I think other specialties like surgery, if Johnson, if you correct me, I know surgery in Hong Kong, the MRCP was recognized, but is no longer recognized. Is that correct, Johnson? Yeah, so the MRCS was recognized, but it's now no longer recognized. So essentially for me, I have to retake my exam, which is a bit annoying, but hey ho, that's Hong Kong. <laughs> so it very much depends on the specialty and, and various colleges you know, I know they're trying to recruit and, and trying to attract more overseas graduates from coming back to Hong Kong. So I'm sure there'll be changes along the way in a couple of months or in a year time where perhaps more intermediate exams like the MRCP or the MRCPCH, more of those in other specialties may get recognized by the colleges. We, we just won't know yet. Thank you. Another Johnson. Another question for Johnson. I was wondering if I could carry on to the UK for F two after passing HKMLE and a year of housemanship in Hong Kong. Um, I've not heard of people going back to UK for F two, um, but potentially after you've done a housemanship year in Hong Kong, you can return to UK uh, or you can apply 
for training in the UK. So you can apply for core medical training or CST or, or whatever you want to apply. So I have heard of people doing that, but I've not heard of people going back to the UK to continue foundation year. So um, I'll, you could complete your foundation too, um, and then do your HK MD, which is when I did it. Or if you know that you're certainly returning back to Hong Kong, you can sometimes, I've heard of people finishing F1 and then the XO. All in all, it really depends on your life situation um, when you want to take your HKMLE. Okay, thank you. So we are eight minutes past 3 p.m. now and we still have many questions. Are the speakers happy to leave their email address so that the participants can contact you for the questions? I... Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll just drop your email address in the chat box below. Yeah, you guys can email either of us. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so let me just end this webinar. A huge thank you to both the speakers, um, Dr. Oscar Chu and Dr. Johnson Tam, um, who have dedicated their time to speak to all of us today. Hope you have all enjoyed the webinar and gained a better understanding in terms of pathway to practicing in Hong Kong and also the HKMLE. So next Sunday, the country that we'll be covering is the United Kingdom and then followed by the US for the following week. So do keep an eye out on our social media, um, on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter if you're interested for this webinar series. And to all the participants, I'll email you a feedback form after this webinar. And the feedback form will be very helpful for us, the organizers, to know what went well and also areas which could be improved. So we highly appreciate if you could spare a few minutes of your time to just complete it. And filling up this webinar um, feedback form also gives you priority to sign up for our next talk. Um, that's the end of our webinar. You may leave now. Thank you. And for the two speakers, do you mind just staying back for a little while for a debriefing? Thank you.